With massive innovation in lighting technology over the last few years, vertical farms have all of a sudden gone from science projects to legitimate businesses capable of feeding lots of people. But as lighting costs go down and the technology improves, it's actually the future of these farms that I'm so interested in. Some people are turned off by the pristine mechanical growing conditions, like it's something out of the matrix, but that's actually what makes it so exciting. Companies like Bowery Farming have the opportunity to re-engineer every aspect of the growing process, even down to the seeds they use, which are optimized for flavor instead of having to worry about insects and weather resistance. Using a system of robotics and automation, all running through what they call the Bowery operating system, Bowery is able to use 95% less water than traditional farms, use zero pesticides and chemicals, be 100 times more productive per square foot of land, and most importantly, build farms right next to cities to avoid the environmental impact of freighting food across the country and the world. So today, I'm here at Bowery's R&D facility to find out how they use technology to make every step of this process as efficient as possible. So what, what's the point in the whole thing? Like, why, why bother? Why bother? Uh, it's actually a legitimate question, right? When you look at farming today, it is the largest consumer of resources globally. 70% of the world's water every year goes to agriculture. And because of the chemically intensive way that we farm now, we've actually lost 30% of our arable farmland in just the last 40 years. One of the things you always hear about vertical farming is it's like, hey, we have a, a power source, it's called the sun. Why are you wasting that? About eight or nine years ago, you actually saw the cost of lights drop by over 85%, and you saw the efficiency of the lights more than double. But before that, this wouldn't work. No. What is the first thing that you guys think about when it comes to growing more efficient crops. The seeds themselves are where everything starts, right? It's where everything starts with any plant. I, I just had my negative test. I'm negative for all oh, STDs good. and COVID. <laughs> so this is the seeder. It's like an, it automates the seeding process. So this is where it starts. So what do you actually need this material for? So when it's a seedling, it's growing roots. So it needs something to anchor itself on. And then there is this drum here that will dibble it. So it pushes the soil just a little bit lower. Right. What this does, it kind of creates like a cone, so if it falls here, it kind of rolls into the hole. How is this different than a seed that like a, a farmer would plant? Well, a farmer could, could also plant a coated seed. There's a vacuum inside the cylinder that's going to pull the seed as this spins, and so every hole will have one seed. If we were to not coat the seed, the machine might pick up three or four seeds because it's not that accurate. But where you have this larger seed, uh, it's, the machine is going to have an easier time Pulling, pulling that one seed and then dropping it into the plug. What would be the downside of having multiple seeds in a plug? Yeah, you wouldn't have nice uh, uniform heads. You might have more loose leaf, for example. This is so cool. Okay, so what happens from here? Well, from here we will take it and then we can transport this to the germination chamber. Germination is the stage where seeds sprout out into seedlings. Typically, you'd need to cover the seeds in topsoil to prevent them from drying out. But because Bowery can guarantee almost 100% humidity, they can leave them uncovered. These flats will stay in here for anywhere between two and maybe six days. From seed to seedling, like in the wild on, a, on an open air farm, how long would this process take? Germination rates are highly dependent on temperature. So here we keep it at constant temperature. So for the most part, it's pretty much every X number of days. We know how many days but in a perfect world outside? Probably uh, a few more days longer. So at every stage of this process, you guys are saving time, right? Yeah, so we will transport them from the germination chamber to, yep, that's okay. Wow, yep, I, I had one job. <laughs> I don't mind sharing, you know, these were in here a little too long, probably, and right. they're slightly elongated. What's wrong with the fact that these are elongated? They redirect resources towards uh, stem to make more stem. We don't want them to do that. We want them to produce more leaf. I can notice yep. something that's going on here, which is this last row didn't get seeded properly. So that would mean that this tray is 10% so or 5% less efficient. More like 2%, but yeah, it'll be about 2% lower than a lower mass. We can, we can even uh, speculate. All right, so this is like a completed tray then. I mean, because we're in the development facility, not everything is the same thing right, if we yeah, were in production. In, in production, you would see like basically the entire thing filled with Right. These seedlings, like, like just one, one of these, so. So now we send this down the line yep. into the mothership, into the growing operation, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. It's pretty 
And cool. From here, the trays are moved into any of the farm's growing positions, where AI scans crop information through imaging and QR codes and gives each crop its own customized plan of water and light. So all these trays have like a, a built-in drain system, right? So the water is continuously flowing. That's right. So the water passes through. We treat the water, give it back the nutrients that it needs. One of your talking points is that you guys use 95% less water than a conventional farm. A large part of that is because we're constantly recirculating. Okay. Our aim is to make sure that really the water that leaves the facility is in the plants. And I keep coming to this point that like yeah. we give this tray what it needs when it needs it is very different than a blanket irrigation right. across you know an acre of farmland. And what does that mean? Do you think of that in, in terms of the height of the water? Height plays a role. Turnover plays a role. Will there always be water touching the bottom of the base? Or no, will it sometimes shut off? Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. We assume that crops need sunlight, but that's not exactly the case, right? There's a spectrum of light, and the plants don't exactly need every part of that. Crops need energy. Okay. And so we've done uh, an immense amount of experimentation looking at different color or spectra of lights. What we've honed in on are these white lights. Outside you have shading and not shading, you have clouds. And so for us to be able to provide a consistent lighting experience right. is right. what's really integral. Do these crops have like bedtime? There's nighttime. There's nighttime. Yeah. But what we can do, yeah. uh, which we're constantly looking to explore and understand and, and exploit really is how do we take advantage of providing more light? So now, this will stay here for a number of days. In this, these smaller plants? These smaller plants in this configuration. And then we'll move it to a, a place in our farm for it to continue its, its life cycle um, as it reaches adulthood. So this is the next stage. How, how, far, how far in are these crops? I would say they're about 10 to 12 days after planting. Okay. And this is where growth really starts to accelerate and they, they start to look like what we what we eat every day. So these trays are, are holding the plants, they're holding the little block of, of peat, right? Yep. And so it doesn't really matter what this material is. No, it's right? just a holder for the plant, Yeah. right? And in fact, the grow media is really just a holder right. that connects the roots together with the plants. This, this grow media isn't giving any nutrients, no, it's not providing any much value other than just keeping things together, just, just like this structure here. So from here, how many how many weeks out are we from harvesting these plants? Generally speaking, our grow cycles are anywhere from like 17 days to, to 32 days. So these have about anywhere from about 10, 10 to 10, 20 12 days, days left? Yeah, left. All right, let's send this guy back. Uh, okay, so we're on the third of five levels of the farm in this operation. Why even bother with a vertical farm? Why bother? Why bother? Uh, well, why bother with the verticality? Why bother with vertical? Well, if you think about it, we could be growing in this warehouse, yeah. and we'd be using one one slice. Right. And so we can be upwards of a hundred times more efficient with land use because of how we stack plants vertically in a farm. Right. But it's essentially a real estate question. It's a real estate question. How high could you go? Like, what? It, what's the limit? There's for... no limit. There's no limit. It's just how high is the the ceiling of a warehouse? The fact that this growing position morphs into whatever this crop needs, lets us grow this here or grow it you know, one or two levels up higher. If things are kind of moving on their own a little bit, why would a, a human being need to get up here when typically these trays are brought down for processing and kind of intervention? We don't really think about how people are involved in the growing process, but how, how do we take people out of the growing process? Yeah. Our goal is to actually have as few people walking around our plants as possible. Sorry about that. Well, ah. We're here for a reason, to spread the word. Spread the seed? To okay. spread it, probably yeah. not. That's part of the trust in Bowery is that we're not, no one's touching these plants while they're growing. All we can do is ruin things. Right? All we can do is ruin things. This is uh, our red leaf lettuce when yeah. it reaches maturity. They've grown up, you know, like we said, about seven to 10 days since we last saw them. So this is the same crop in the middle of harvesting. I just was hoping you could show us the root system. Yeah, let's lift this up. Wow. And look at that. Holy look shoot. at that root development. It's so different yeah. than those seedlings, right? You want all the water in the farm to go out in the boxes. That's the ideal, right? So now we'll drain this tray, get it out of here, and then it'll be harvested and uh, sold to the public. That's right. Untouched. Untouched. All right, so we've made it. We've seen the way that the romaine gets from seed to this point. Um, obviously, this is not how you guys would harvest it in the real world. I know you have a deluxe line of machines that they may or may not give me the B-roll access to. 
but um, for I just yeah, I mean I would I'd love to try it with you right well, now. Well, you've been just... in the farm all day, so the last the most important thing you can do is actually try the product you've been a part of. Growing. That's my one. That's my one leaf that I get. Well, I was giving you one to try. I guess you have a mask on, so it's a little trickier. See, you get the sweetness. It's got the whole spectrum of flavor in there. Yeah. It's as if it grew in someone's, you know, countryside farmland. Just using a lot less water, a lot less chemicals, a lot less in general. So not to get like doomsday-ish, but if we didn't figure out these new ways of farming, what would our food supply look like in 50 years? You know, nine to 10 billion people that'll be on the planet in the next 30 years. Right. And according to the UN, you need somewhere between 50 to 70% more food to feed that population. Mm -hmm. And all the while, 70 to 80% of the population is actually gonna be living in and around cities. So there's this real move towards urbanization. Figuring out how do you feed and how do you provide fresh food to urban environments, both more efficiently as well as more sustainably, is a very important question today and an even more important question in the years to come. When you you spent so much time obsessing over proximity and how close am I to the source of what I'm consuming. When you leave, do you just want to like really mess shit up and order like a whole tuna in from Japan? <laughs> for better or for worse, the more you understand the food supply chain, the more you realize how convoluted and complex it really is. And I think if there's anything COVID showed us, it actually yeah. was just that. I think we took for granted for a long time the fact that you could walk into a store and find anything you wanted whenever you wanted it. And that wasn't true for a period of time. And I think it shined a light for people on how reliant we are in other parts of the country, other parts of the world for that matter.